boy. As soon as I make a anime tower theory, immediately Game Tears decides to upload and make a FNAF theory because that's how consistent we are. Besides one smaller than the other. Game Theory in this example is smaller than me. It's your action video, duh. Hey guys, welcome to Game Theory FNAF Another Mystery Solved. Probably gonna, not gonna be solved because what's really solved in FNAF? Besides pizza that give you diabetes, that's really it. Anyways, watch. And probably this time I've got the camera right. Probably. Mm. Wait, give me one second. Is this thing on the, like, the lowest? Okay. We're going AC this time. We're going to blow the AC because we live in the That's I just don't know why it just looks like so pixely. Showtime. You can be a pirate, but first you'll have to lose an eye and an arm. You can be a pirate, to lose an eye and an arm. First you need to lose an eye and an arm. Lose an eye, lose an eye, lose an eye, lose an eye. Hi. And an arm. Okay, so other word that's. Um, Cheer Hello, around, buddy. Internet. Welcome to Game Theory, the show that is, without exaggeration, thinking of reaching out to Scott Cawthon so that we can jointly buy Chuck E. Cheese's quickly dying restaurant franchise so we can transform yep. into what they were always meant to be, real world FNAF experiences. Heck, they've already got the terrible pizza taken care of. Oh, we probably even sell the idea to YouTube Originals and make a whole series about transforming the pizzerias into horror-themed dining experiences. I well, will go there. Spare I would have gone there. I would have... I don't care. I would have if felt that way. The cost of doing all that. No I don't care. Here, Scott. This is something we if I die in that, I don't care. It's my my dream come true. At least I can die happy, but at the same time, I can shit my pants. I can die my own shit at least. Absolutely can and probably should do. I've recreated your games before yep. in real life, and they seem I to be pretty this. well received. <laughs> So, between my theater background and your, well, you know, your gobs of money and masterminding of the IP, I think we can make something that's really cool. And yeah, the reason I'm bringing it up here is so fans can start talking about the idea both here and on Reddit to show you how excited they are for this to happen. Anyway, let me just leave it at yes. I have my email. I eagerly await your response. Who knows, you've probably already bought it at this point. You're just waiting to reveal that fact to the world. Speaking of <laughs> Chuck E. Cheese restaurants, the grandpappy of FNAF, I actually have a theory in the works about those pizzerias that any FNAF fan will enjoy. The episode will be going live in the next few weeks on my newest theory channel, right. Food Theory, which yes. if you haven't checked out yet, you totally should. Link is down in the description. Yes, it sounds like a joke. No, it's not. We've not only got episodes about Chuck E. Cheese on the way, but also horror episodes like how the ghost of KFC's Colonel Sanders has been cursing people for decades. Yes, it is a real thing that we are currently researching. It's the same science right, math and over-research that we do over here except you know on real life topics and for anyone who's hesitant to check out a channel about food we're already winning people over like jack here over on twitter who said he started out skeptical but watched the episodes and immediately got the concept we've got over half a million subscribers in the first 24 hours and we're getting really really close to that million in these first two weeks so please 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 help us reach that milestone i see a big number and i look at eyes we theorists are by shattering that subscriber record speak about subscribe button subscribe if you're not new. I know if you watch these videos, subscribe if you're not new. There are more theory dumbass videos that I'm trying to make funny jokes, but don't really work out. Huh. Anyway. Hey, FNAF even already has made an appearance on the show. It's in every single intro of Food Theory. So subscribe to Food Theory today to get your daily I wonder why. In a sucky, sucky, no good, awful year, seeing so many people excited about this new channel has really helped us all out. So thank you guys for your support. Thank you for your subscription. And I can't wait to deliver you more. It's been a lot of work, but it's really fun. All right. A new month, a new FNAF book, a new set of lore reveals. Earlier this month, the latest Fazbear Fright book, 
step closer away from mine. to shelves, and even though it has a super forgettable name, the stories inside of it are epic. Not just because they're some of the most gruesome epic of the series. I mean, page one literally starts with a dream sequence where a kid's eye gets popped by Foxy's hook, but because mm. of the lore drops that are happening in this thing, they are huge. Up until this point, the Fazbear Frights books have given us interesting concepts to chew on, fleshing out the world of FNAF and giving us new insights into events that we already had a pretty good handle on. It's been useful, certainly, but nothing too earth-shattering. Animatronics can have people stuffed inside of them. Confirmed outright in book one. People can have animatronics stuffed inside of them. Confirmed in book three. Everything is powered by human agony. The missing children's incident probably happened in 1985. Animatronics can steal identities. Humans can be body-swapped with animatronics. Golden Freddy might have multiple souls trapped inside of him. Ghosts might be able to escape from their animatronic prisons to lure more people to them. Like, there has been a lot across all of these stories. Yes, and so a lot. Covering these books so much. But Step Closer's lore drops are attacking some of the biggest lingering questions still in existence from these games. The ones presented to us by the two most frustrating games in the franchise, FNAF 4 and FNAF 6. Questions that are still oh, hotly yeah. debated by the FNAF community. So today we're looking at the first of those debates. Oh, the ones yes. related to FNAF 4. And looking at what those answers mean for the rest of the series. Mm. Today we confirm the identity of this guy. The older brother, Foxy Bro. Real Murder! Quick, get criminal! This criminal! Series, criminal! Let's criminal. speed our way through probably the least important story of this new trio, the middle one titled Dance With Me. In it, nah. we cover Casey, a young nah. woman who's coming from a tragic childhood. She lives on the street, picking pockets and nabbing purses. One day, she robs a mother and a young girl outside of Circus Baby's Pizza World, which we're told mm. has itself a big red door. Woo! 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 Potentially a detail alert. Anyway, uh, one of the items that she nabs is a set of cardboard glasses. When Casey puts them on, she sees a hologram of Ballora spinning in the distance. Weirded out by this, she has other people try the glasses on and no one else manages to see Ballora. From that point onward, each time she puts on the glasses, the hologram gets closer and closer, which begins to freak her out to the point of her angel. leaving town and trying to put her life back together in hopes that it gets Ballora to leave her alone. A couple cities and failed jobs later, Casey eventually decides to return the stolen items to the mother and the daughter, hoping that it'll make amends. The family welcomes her in and forgives her, but when the little girl Isabella puts White. the glasses on, she not only sees Ballora, but she immediately begins dancing. It's a very vague ending because it's unclear whether Ballora, who was one step away from getting Casey, instead nabs the girl because she's the one who puts the glasses on next, and the dancing is the girl becoming possessed, or if it's the girl just excited to be dancing alongside one of her favorite characters, Ballora. Anyway, there's not a whole lot to talk about with this one. The technology is is super strange. Freddy's is apparently advanced enough to have holographics that work in cheap cardboard glass. We have Stavers. Classes for kids. Clearly. That is strange enough, but there's also some extra weirdness that the holograms can interact with the physical world. We see throughout the story that this Ballora hologram kicks up leaves and causes them to swirl around her. To quote from the story, there was Ballora, pirouetting among That's the colorful problem. fall leaves. As she spun, the bright leaves were sucked into her vortex. For a few seconds, Casey admired the beauty, but then she thought, wait, if Ballora is just a picture, a hologram, then how is she affecting the objects around her? It didn't make sense. Don't well, in the world of being a FNAF theorist, Casey, mm -hmm. it didn't make sense. Prepare to get that one tattooed on your forehead. But in all seriousness, it does First raise joke a I ever. question. Is she actually a hologram or just invisible and the glasses are somehow revealing her? It's unclear. Today I'm going to be talking a lot about those weird little details that just seem so oddly specific for a book to call out that it feels like the book is trying to tell us something. And this seems like one of them, but while I could spend a lot of time trying to figure it out, to my knowledge, holographic or invisible visible animatronics haven't really been a thing yet in the franchise, so we'll just have to cross that bridge when it becomes important. Unless, oh damn it, it might be a phantom animatronic. No, no, they don't interact with the real world, do they? Last point to be made yeah. about this story, though, is it's recurring it's the ventilation. mothers and motherhood. A lot of the backstory that we get on Casey is her troubled relationship with her mom, which has played a big part in how her life ended up the way it did. Casey, throughout the story, is also just visited four. by an older woman at a bus station that gives her grandmotherly advice. She's saved from the police by another elder woman. She makes amends with that mother and daughter that have a relationship that she envies. I mean, it could be me thinking too much about this. Big surprise. But it doesn't feel like a coincidence that Ballora is the main animatronic featured in a story about motherly relationships. I had a theory a long time ago, two years ago, that Ballora was some William sort Afton's. of stand-in for Mrs. Afton. Yep. Not in any sort of creepy way. Get your mind out of the gutters. I mean, that she represents the wife that William Afton lost or divorced him or 
most likely that he abandoned in the aftermath of his daughter getting clawed to death by baby. I mean, just look at the song that Ballora sings in Sister Location. Why do you hide inside these walls? This is a creepy song. Music in my home. All I see is an empty room, whatever. And empty tomb. I remember and nothing empty of the song. Tomb, AKA the bedroom of our tragically deceased child, William hides inside his walls by diving even deeper into his work. It's something that William's partner Henry does in the original novel trilogy. When he loses his daughter, he shuts out the rest of the world, hiding behind his walls and obsessing over his work to try and bring her back. And so when William does this in the games, his wife is left alone and probably ends up leaving him. As such, as some sort of coping mechanism, William recreates her in animatronic form, depicting her with perpetually shut eyes because to William, she was blind to what needed to be done to rebuild the family. Blind to the fact that his work was so important. She wanted to move on, to do frivolous things like sing and spin and dance, or at least that's how he felt from his perspective. William yeah, Madden was mired in his own misery of loss. Like I said, it's a bit of a stretch and something that I've lightly talked about before, but I thought the connection between Ballora and mothers in this story was particularly interesting and worth calling out. Anyway, onward to the real story I want to address today, Step Closer, which isn't just and new theories, but is straight up confirming stuff that we've argued about for years. In it, we meet Pete, a 16-year-old who, due to their parents' divorce, has to babysit his little brother, Chuck the Chump. I love day, how Scott can think of these things, or Pete, annoyed about the having to be the responsible one, decides to scare Chuck a little by taking him backstage to see an out-of-service foxy. Pete fires up the oh, machine and Chuck dude. runs away, leaving Pete alone to get seemingly hypnotized by Foxy's performance, a performance that repeats one line over and over. You can be a pirate, but first you'll have to lose an eye and an arm. And from there, you can probably guess what happens. Over the next few days, Pete gets into multiple accidents that put either his eye or his arm in danger. A scalpel nearly hits his eye in science class. A butcher knife almost chops off his hand at the store. A buzzsaw blade shoots out at him from a nearby construction site. He gets hooked in the face by a fishing line, and he almost loses a hand to a Chinese finger trap at the school carnival. Anyway, the two brothers eventually make amends and come to the realization that Pete needs to face down Foxy to break some curse. Pete rushes to Freddy's, but in his panic, he's hit by an oncoming truck and killed. Out of nowhere. It's this awful, awful reveal that you absolutely oh boy. do not see coming because you feel so bad for this kid. You're like, oh, he's apologized to his brother. They have a good relationship. They have a plan for getting Pete out of this after him being brutalized for the better part of a week. And on dead. his way to close off the story and then, bam, he's it just dead. ends. And that would be where the story ends, except for one thing. Pete is still alive. Besides him. We pick up back in the hospital oh, where Pete's soul is trapped inside of his own dead body. Pete is an organ donor. Against his will, I might add. Thanks a lot for signing me up for that one, Mom. And they just got an emergency request for, you guessed it, an eye and a hand. Pete is forced to helplessly watch as his body is taken apart by surgeons. Like I said, oh, the that episode, is this so story effed up. is shocking. But what's even more shocking is, is the is... lore confirmation that we get in this. Just imagine that. Pete... You witness as they take your arm and your eye out. Or oh, think of it. You imagine it. You sit there. You just sit there. And you witness and you feel it. No, 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 I don't want to. I, I just don't. Ugh. You must uh, just go, just, just go to hell where, or heaven, wherever. Just go anywhere. Besides there. Story 100% confirms for us that Foxy Bro, the older kid from FNAF 4 who repeatedly traumatizes his younger brother before eventually getting him chucked so to the jaw of bear, that is undeniably Michael Afton. 100% oh, yeah. no doubt. It's something that we strongly suspected for a while, and something that later evidence started to throw into question, but this story, happening five years after that game's initial release, finally clears it up for us. Obviously, there are some superficial similarities here. Pete has a younger brother who's scared of the animatronics, just like Foxy Bro has the crying child, his younger brother who's scared of the animatronics. Pete is connected to Foxy throughout the story, just like the brother in the Foxy mask. Pete and Chuck's parents are divorced, just like it seems William and Mrs. Afton are in the game, leaving the older brothers alone to care for their younger siblings. At one point in the story, Pete's hand starts to turn purple, which points us back to Michael Afton and sister location physically turning that purple. Happens. And lastly is that final scene where Pete should be dead, but isn't, which is exactly mirrors the iconic words of one Michael Afton. Father, 
It's me, Michael. I should, I should be dead, dead but, but I'm not. not. But all of it is just a bunch of weak parallels between Foxy Bro and Michael, and Michael and Pete, and Foxy Bro and Pete. How do we know for sure that all three of these characters are connected? One word, gum. People ask me a lot who right. I come up with these theories, and more often than not, it's small details that just stick out as off for the author or game designer to include, as though they're purposely seeding these details out there to try and signal something to us. And in this particular story, the odd character detail of Pete is that he chews gum a lot. Page four, he's chewing watermelon gum while watching his brother. Later, when he's scared by the foxy that's animatronic, so the book makes mention of him swallowing that gum. Okay, that's fine. That's a one-off thing. No big deal. But later, on the way to the butcher shop, we're told that he, quote, pops a wad of watermelon gum into his mouth. On the boat fishing with his dad, he wishes he had brought his watermelon gum. It is mentioned a lot in this short story, enough that it sparked my fear senses and made me flag it to look into later. Now, obviously, at no point during FNAF 4, or heck, any of the games, do we see a character actively chewing gum. That'd be silly, but no. that's not the only place that we see these characters at this point. Let me direct your book. attention back to the FNAF survival logbook. Yes, oh bloody god, the most stupid bloody dumbass book ever created that I love but also hate. Let me guess. It has to be like a picture, you know, that's something about gum. There has to be like a blight picture, yeah. Wait! I remember something. I remember something. I remember something. I remember something from this book. I didn't even look at it. I remember something. Where the hell is it? It's like on the right page. Like right side of the page book. There it is! Chewing gum excessively. Are you putting that out? Over there. I know it's surprising also... Yeah, it's a bit surprising it's like right next to the page with Foxy on. Huh? Go ne go go on. Who knew that a book with dabbing Chica as an active selling feature would become supposed the to be a joke item for lore solving of this franchise? For those of you who don't remember this little gem, it's the logbook originally owned by Mike, as we see on the title page, that helped us to solve for Cassidy's name. And wouldn't you know it? But today, it's also the thing that's gonna now reveal to us Michael Afton's true identity. Page forty-nine. Quote: List ten bad habits you'd like to break. Number one: chewing gum excessively. I mean, there it is, plain as day. Pete chews gum excessively. Michael Afton chews gum excessively. Pete eventually turns purple and comes back to life after being dead. Michael Afton eventually turns purple and comes to life after being dead. Pete is an older brother who scares his younger sibling using Foxy. Foxy bro in FNAF 4 is an older brother who scares his younger sibling with Foxy. Pete equals Michael, and Michael equals FNAF 4's Foxy bro. Done. Confirmed. Another character identity locked. This detail has been yes. sitting in the logbook for years. Just because waiting. It was so weird that chewing gum excessively was in here. Like, that's a so random. Now I can't understand it. Used. Kind of impressive. Well done there, Scott. Well done. And this confirmation tells us everything we need to know about Michael's motivation for the rest of the game series. He's avenging his brother's death. The one that he made happen. When Golden Freddy appearances are accompanied by the words, It's me. It is literally the younger brother saying, It's me. I'm here to his older brother. But of course, of course, of course, it is never that easy. This same security logbook. This thing that has been so pivotal to solving so many mysteries of this franchise franchise raises just as many challenges because sure yes. here it just confirmed the foxy bro connection but then At it least also has lines like these page 103 the party was for you page 75 does he still talk to you in reference to psychic friend fredbear page 23 was your favorite childhood toy a plastic purple telephone page 20 what do you remember and most troublesome of all page 31 do you remember your name all of these questions seem pointed to the crying child the party was for him. His favorite toy was the purple telephone. Fredbear did talk to him and never to Foxy Bro as far as we know. In fact, these are the exact questions that got us to throw the Foxy Michael connection away so many years ago. Why would the spirit in this book, Cassidy, be telling Mike things that are very clearly true of the crying child? If Mike was indeed the older brother the entire time, like this latest Fazbear Fright story just confirmed for us, it doesn't make sense. Which is why now we have to solve these last two questions. What do you remember? Do you remember your name? 
I mean, now, yeah, I do remember my name. It's Mike. I wrote Mike on the first page of the book, didn't but you I? Unless it out. Mike never truly was my name. The question that we're left with, and the question I pose to you and that I still need time to think through is, what did Michael forget? And how did he forget it? Was he the bite of 87 victim? Is that how he lost his memory? Did some sort of other trauma cause him memory loss? And more importantly, is there some other strange connection between Michael and the crying child? Like, seriously, why would the book say that the party was for Michael when FNAF 4 clearly tells us that it's not? I can't believe that this is just some sort of typo or something. This book is so precisely engineered to be the linchpin in too many mysteries of this franchise for that to be the case. So could that connection between the two brothers be the reason why Michael's name might somehow be different? All theories for another day, my friends. But at least for now, right. we're one more confirmed step closer to getting the answers we've been looking for for so long. So maybe that's the reason why the story is in fact called Step Closer. Because otherwise, that title for a story about a kid losing an eye and an arm just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Next time, we tackle Susie and her connections to FNAF 6. Hmm. In the meantime, remember that Food Theory exists as a channel. Yes. Go and subscribe to the Food Theory and also check out this video as well. I don't have to talk over it. I still am bloody surprised of how Scott has made the lore for this game. From the first game. I don't know if he intended to do it, but from the first game. Like, he didn't know it was going to be the biggest game ever, let's be honest, because he was a failed game developer. But now he's bloody successful in all bloody ways and possible. Um, so you don't just point, you don't put like 50 million lore elements in one game, then you think, ah, oh, I'm not going to make it one. I'm so surprised he actually did that. And now we, uh, we are six years, almost six years, seven days away. And by the way, today or tomorrow, probably tomorrow, I am going to be doing something. FNAF month anyway, so FNAF games. Put them together. Yeah. I'm so surprised how Scott Eckler made this, but I can't wait for my book. <sighs> Shipping over here, it's shit. Oh yeah, I can say that. I have the right to say that. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed. And thank you for 2,721 subscribers. Thank you for that. You know, I'll see you guys next video. And check out the MS out there that will be down somewhere. Wherever the hell it is. Probably over me or underneath me. That I just made. And I'll see you guys next video. Goodbye.